Chicago, for better or worse, the epitome of the modern city. For good or ill, the face of the 20th century, a man-made geometric landscape of glass, concrete and steel. Much of the 20th century face was first fashioned not here in the new world, but in the old, in a revolutionary school of architecture and design, founded in a small provincial town in Germany at a moment of political unrest and economic chaos. It was called the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus meant something to everybody. See, the myth was already spread around that if it was Bauhaus, it must be either good or bad, depending on what your opinion was. Ja, Im Bauhaus verdichteten sich tatsächlich viele Avantgarde-Ideen, viele auch revolutionäre Ideen äh, der 20er Jahre. Es gab einfach in ganz Europa keine Kunsthochschule, die so komprimiert die Neuerungen tatsächlich in die Praxis überführt haben. Etwas ganz anderes bewirkt als alle Kunstschulen und alle technischen Hochschulen. Es hat einfach einen Weg gesucht, wie man mit dem Leben ästhetisch fertig wird. The Bauhaus was the greatest design institution of the 20th century, without a doubt. It's affected everything. Our cities on a huge scale turned them into rather mechanical machines. And it's turned our interiors into rather nice, simplified, kitchen-like instruments. The uh, contribution of Bauhaus bestand darin, that we, what I nennen möchte, eine optische Wissenschaft sammelten. Bauhaus was born out of catastrophe. The new world it helped to shape came painfully into being some three quarters of a century ago, even as the old world was collapsing. The Bauhaus was the idea of Walter Gropius, a German architect who, while serving as an officer in the Great War, dreamed about a school of art and design that would help change the world. The nightmare of war, the mechanized slaughter, made Gropius long for a world in which the machine would be tamed for the benefit of man. Well, I still remember when I came out of the First World War, and there was one moment in my life which I do not forget, but all of a sudden I became aware that I would have to take part in something completely new which would change the conditions I had been living in before. When I think of the beginning of my life, there had been utopian ideas and nobody thought that they might become reality, but they have become reality today. After the war, Gropius began to make his utopian dream come true. He was asked to found an art school and expressed his revolutionary ideas in a manifesto published early in 1919. The school would be called the Bauhaus, Building House, and the manifesto was illustrated by a dramatic woodcut of a Gothic cathedral, its spire soaring up towards the starry sky. The ultimate aim of all creative activity is the building. We must all return to the crafts. The school is the servant of the workshops and will one day be absorbed by them. Let us together create the new building of the future which will one day rise towards the heavens as the crystalline symbol of a new and coming faith. Gropius was not alone in his utopian aspirations, 
his school was supported by public funds. The revolutionary tone of the Bauhaus Manifesto echoed the spirit of the times. The Soviet Revolution and the German mutinies it inspired helped end the war. The armistice and abdication of the Kaiser were followed by an abortive communist revolution in Germany and the declaration of a republic from the balcony of the Royal Palace in Berlin. The Bauhaus was founded in the old city of Weimar, where the new German constitution was also devised. While the Bauhaus began work, the politicians debated in a theatre half a mile away. They met there because Weimar was less troubled by rioting than Berlin and because Weimar, once the home of the writers Goethe and Schiller, was regarded as the cultural heart of the nation. In these two buildings, a revolution in art education took place. It was a revolution which gave us the method of workshop-based training used in many schools of art and craft today. Dann war mir klar, dass äh, eine größere Verbindung zwischen den neuen produktionswaffenden Maschinen und dem künstlerischen Menschen hergestellt werden müsste. Und folgendessen habe ich Werkstätten errichtet, in denen die Leute von zwei Seiten erzogen wurden. Einmal vom künstlerischen und vom anderen vom handwerklichen. Es ist oft missverstanden worden, dass das auf Handwerk aufgebaut war. Das war aber eine Zelle der Vorbereitung. Man kann nicht eine Maschine verstehen, bevor man nicht die Handwerkszeuge verstanden hat. So the backbone of the Bauhaus in Weimar was its workshops, where the students, known as apprentices, acquired their skills not by designing on paper, but by actually making things. Chairs and other types of furniture in wood, for example book bindings, stained glass, implements in glass and metal, fabrics or ceramics. A major innovation at the Bauhaus was that craft skills were taught by master craftsmen while aesthetic inspiration came from artists. The pottery workshop was run by a master craftsman under the artistic supervision of the sculptor Gerhard Marx, who relished the bohemian atmosphere at the Bauhaus. Wirklich? Da war Leben, und zwar künstlerisches Leben. Also das hieß, dass man sich die Schuhe auf die nackten Füße malte und Umzüge machte und äh, rote Fahnen anklebten und so weiter. An Persönlichkeiten unter Schülern und Lehrern fehlte es wirklich am Bauhaus nicht. In my mind, the painters of the modern time had done some constructive thinking. They had developed a certain philosophy as to artistic space and colors and form. So I thought, though the final aim of the Bauhaus for me was architecture, that the painters might be able to bring in really the beginning of a new constructive thought. And they have shown that it was so. We have to pull the whole thing together. We have to destroy these separations between painting and sculpture and architecture and design and so on. It is all one. Gropius didn't employ just any artists in his search for teachers who could think constructively. On the Bauhaus staff were some of the most original painters of the age. There was the Swiss, Paul Klee, a mystic, as gifted a violinist as he was an artist. There was Vasily Kandinsky too, the Russian who, before the Great War, had virtually invented abstract painting.
He was now developing a visual language consisting of triangles, circles and squares, expressive textures and dynamically moving lines. Kandinsky's compositions made no reference to nature. They were shaped by the way he felt. Another painter who taught at the Bauhaus was Johannes Itten, a metaphysical dreamer who was responsible for one of the many innovations which made the Bauhaus such a remarkable school. This was the compulsory foundation course to which Clay and Kandinsky also contributed. Johannes Itten's foundation course was the basic unifying factor in the Bauhaus for its entire period. Johannes Itten was there for three years and he was the one to invent this method of teaching where he would start off with uh, breathing exercises, with intense introspection, with a kind of Buddhist-like calm, which he learned actually from Buddhism. Itzen was also a disciple of Mazdaznan, a variety of Zoroastrianism in whose service he shaved his head and wore monkish robes even while teaching. Well, Bauhaus was the first time in art and design education that the emphasis had been put on the individual student, the student's emotions and senses and intellect. And it was also the first time that design had been taught in a coherent way within an art context. A student would arrive and enroll for the preliminary course, and instead of previous preliminary courses which had been all about the history of art and learning about the solutions of past ages you went straight into abstract forms you learnt about materials and their textures you learnt about colour theory so it was a kind of grammar that you learnt for six months to find out about your individuality and which direction will you go that was the basic structure of the course in drawing as well as in three-dimensional design um, a great stress was laid on texture. We had to imitate texture of wood, of glass, of wool, of uh, anything we found interesting in contrast to other textures. And also, we were asked to build up three-dimensional structures of various materials. Since it was a depression, a period when they had no money, you had to work with what was at hand. So you would say to the students, go out to the junkyard and pick up from the scrap heap where you can, and then try to find out what's in the materials, in the nature of materials. My girlfriend, for example, had cut her hair short at that time. So I used some of her hair for a combination of uh, things which I had found and uh, uh, built up into a three-dimensional structure. The Bauhaus invented the modern art student. I mean, up until the Bauhaus, art students were rather conformist characters who sat in serried ranks, all doing the same thing, all rather middle-class people doing watercolours and copies of antique uh, sculptures and so on. And from the word go, the Bauhaus attracted a certain kind of rather politically radical student. I was a student only 16 years old at that time, and I liked it in at the Bauhaus because it's so incredibly free and I could do whatever I liked uh, at the Bauhaus, anything, anything you liked. My little group went to the theater and there was a statue of Goethe and Schiller and we painted Goethe and Schiller red. <laughs> The students were always doing these things, and I was amongst them. 
By 1920, the local inhabitants of Weimar are already complaining that they dress in this outlandish way. They dress like beggars, nude bathing at midnight, strange music at weekends. Because it was residential, they have these wonderful parties and theatre events and things at weekends. So, you know, your long-haired radical art student begins with the Bauhaus. So that's one aspect of it that made the locals very uneasy, I think. When Gropius opened the school in Weimar, he said that he wanted everyone to, who applied to have a chance to get in. He said there was to be no deference to ladies. As far as work is concerned, we are all craftsmen. One of the problems, of course, was that many, many women applied, far too many as far as he was concerned. So after a year, he had to begin to segregate them and put them into various workshops because he felt that metalwork and furniture was too difficult for women to be doing. So they were directed into the pottery workshop and into the bookbinding workshop and into the weaving workshop which means, of course, they are stereotyped to a certain extent into doing what was considered to be women's work. Weaving is women's work. And obviously art can move into textile design and weaving more comfortably, perhaps, than more formal preoccupations. So that in the early years, the designers and textiles are producing these magnificent weaves, tapestries, which are there to be hung on walls. One of the most brilliant women students, Mariana Brunt, wasn't a weaver, however. A member of the metal workshop, she made some extraordinarily beautiful household utensils in copper and other materials. By the time Brandt was producing her characteristically refined and functional objects, the Bauhaus workshops had begun to move away from individually crafted pieces towards products made as prototypes with later industrial manufacture and a mass market in mind. Elegant, simple pieces are the forerunners of what today passes in every home for good, thoroughly modern design. Then they seemed startlingly plain. Everyday objects like tea infusers were designed in terms of their function and the need for mass production. Some products were already being manufactured in series by the Bauhaus workshops. A chess set with pieces signalling the way they moved across the board sold well. A cradle consisting only of triangles, circles and rectangles in the primary colours remained unique. A range of wooden toys made up of separate, brightly coloured elements is still on sale today. The design of many of these products was closely linked to foundation course teaching, in which there was an emphasis on colour and geometry. In the foundation course, attempts were made to subject form and colour to scientific laws. Kandinsky taught that the primary forms, the circle, the square, the triangle, represent and convey qualities identical to those inherent in the primary colours, blue, red and yellow. Primary colours and shapes also inspired the productions of the Bauhaus Theatre workshop. Theatre was central to Bauhaus teaching because it provided a way of bringing several artistic forms into an intimate and expressive unity. Its artistic director was the painter and sculptor Oskar Schlemmer.
Ich halte die Bühnenwerkstatt des Bauhauses für eine der wichtigsten, zentralen äh, Punkte dieser Institution, weil sie am deutlichsten den Gemeinschaftsgedanken äh, in die Tat umgesetzt haben. Die Studierenden konnten also sowohl Architektur, äh, Kostüme und Masken entwerfen und experimentieren. Und das konnte man in dieser Vielfalt tatsächlich nur an der Bühnenwerkstatt. We did things like that. And there's my leg in there. <laughs> my teachers at the time were Schlemmer, Klee, Kandinsky, and it was Moholy Nodge, who was the teacher for the foundation. And he was marvelous and wonderful and quite, quite wonderful. Laszlo Moholy Nodge was a Hungarian constructivist and the master of many media. He took over the foundation course in 1923, sweeping away Itten's metaphysics and mysticism, replacing them with the mystique of the machine. Moholy Nagy was an extremely lively personality. He was almost childlike in his interest that everything new which came up in techniques and so on electrified him. He went right after that. He was an experimental fellow. He tried everything out himself. He was perhaps the closest friend of mine in the bars. And we influenced each other quite a bit. Murinagi was understanding what was going on in the economy and in the industrial life of the modern time and tried to build his ideas into that. The new foundation course was also taught by Joseph Albers, who came to the Bauhaus as a student in 1919 and became the first graduate to teach there. When I aus einem Material etwas herstelle, dann sollte ich die Kräfte, die in dem Material sind, auch benutzen und nicht zudecken. Also dieses in dem Material denken war sein Ziel. Und er stellte Aufgaben, die etwa so lauteten wie mit dem großen Stück Packpapier, das etwa ein Jahr groß ist, aus dem man Raum herstellen musste. Man konnte es falten, man konnte es schneiden, also alles das tun, was man sagt. Wir entdeckten dann, dass man es senkrecht belasten kann. Wir haben Faltungen gemacht, worauf ein Mann stehen konnte. Aber Alles zusammen gesehen ist der Albers ein Mensch, der systematisch den jungen Leuten die Verrücktigkeit des Künstlers austreibt und ihn zum vernünftigen, deutlichen Denken bringt. The paper constructions made under Albers' supervision trained the students to think not so much like artists, as engineers. In 1923, the Bauhaus finally went public. The local government demanded to see what was being done with taxpayers' money, so it was agreed to mount an exhibition. Die Ausstellung von 1923 hatte einen doppelten Charakter. Einmal stellte sie die Arbeitsergebnisse der ersten äh, Jahre der Schule in sehr wirkungsvoller äh, Form Da in Weimar, es brachte sehr viel nationale Aufmerksamkeit, ja sogar auch einige internationale Aufmerksamkeit nach Weimar. Zugleich aber machte diese Ausstellung schon die Wende von dem eher expressionistischen frühen Bauhaus zum konstruktivistischen späteren Bauhaus deutlich. 
The most important feature of the exhibition was a house built on a hill overlooking the Weimar Park on a street called Amhorn. The site was on a field used to grow fruit and vegetables for the Bauhaus canteen. The house was constructed from prefabricated parts and furnished entirely by the Bauhaus workshops. It was ecologically sound, cheap to build and easy to run. The house am Horn gave a shape to dreams about a better world. The house am Horn was the experimental house built with the purpose to be so economic in price that uh, a skilled worker in Germany would be able to afford it with all the more commons included like central heating and bathroom. This was of course one of our ideals. We wanted to penetrate into the mass market because we thought once our things are economically priced for the man in the street and let's say available to be bought in shops like Woolworths, then of course we will succeed in changing the environment and that we felt would be also changing man towards a better being. designed a kitchen which is a laboratory for cooking. They are using ceramics and glass that's been designed in the workshops and uh, it's not a sort of kitchen living room which most medium class houses have tended to have or a kitchen in which the servants would work which is totally segregated from the rest of the house. It's part of the unit of the house but at the same time it's laid out along rational principles. In these kitchens, they had everything, the storage, the layout, to produce an efficient centre of the household. The kitchen is remarkable in that it's a very early expression of American ideas of household management. In 1923, hyperinflation was raging. And so the house Am Horn, intended to be built and sold in large numbers, remained the only one of its kind. As the printing presses ran hot, the zeros on the banknotes multiplied. Some of the notes were even designed at the Bauhaus. Unemployment rose. Radical politics flourished. The Bauhaus had never been popular in Weimar. Now, increasingly branded communist, its future in a reactionary city looked bleak. The politics was all left-wing. Some of them were communists. And, and, and shouting it about, uh, and I, I was doing it myself. And the Weimar citizens spat down the pavement because we were the enemy. Even that time, there were Nazi marching through the Weimar streets, protesting against communists. The nationalsozialist Welle came first der Starkhoch in Thüringen. Und wie es ja leider war, auch künstlerische Dinge wurden zum Spielball in der Politik benutzt. Und so war es also ein Kampf der Parteien, wie diese äh, nationalsozialistische, damals völkische Partei stärker wurde in Weimar, wurde uns der Dampf abgeschnitten. Und ich habe mich mit meiner Fakultät zusammengesetzt und wir haben in der Öffentlichkeit das Bauhaus als beschlossen erklärt. Und haben so der Regierung damals den Dampf aus den Segeln genommen. In 1925, the Bauhaus reopened in Dessau, 
an industrial city to the north. Dessau was politically more liberal than Weimar. It was also richer, thanks to its chemical and engineering works. Junkers, one of the world's most advanced aircraft manufacturers, had its headquarters there. Since the Bauhaus workshops were now designing for industrial manufacture and mass production, Dessau seemed like its natural home. There was money for a huge school building which Gropius designed. Thanks to advanced construction techniques, it took little more than a year to build in glass, steel and concrete. Everything was under one roof, the workshops, offices, canteen and student flats. It was the crystalline cathedral of functionalism. The Bauhaus was one of the first buildings in Europe to express the hunger for directness and simplicity which affected architecture almost everywhere at the time and were the most visible characteristics of the international style. Es ist in seiner Anmutung ein kristallines, klares, wunderschönes Gebäude, ein Musterbeispiel für Konstruktivismus. Und es ist bautechnisch ein unglaublich modernes Gebäude, denn alle die großen Glaswände sind Vorhänge, die von oben herunterhängen. Die stehen nicht, sie sind nicht tragend, sie sind Vorhänge. Filled with light, uncluttered, somehow severe and clinical, the Bauhaus looked less like an art school than a huge laboratory. Appropriately enough, its leading teachers, Kandinsky, Clay and Gropius, looked less like artists than chemists or mathematicians. The workshops designed and manufactured all the furniture and fittings for the new building. They were elegantly plain, intensely rational, and made by machines in new materials. In the workshops, handicraft yielded totally to design for industrial manufacture. Modern life demanded modern methods and materials. In furniture, metal replaced wood. Screws, glue and dovetail joints were superseded by welding. Chairs, intended for the small functional interiors of modern dwellings, followed the principles not of aesthetics, but engineering. They were inspired not by the bulky, ornate furniture of the past, but by cars, aeroplanes and racing bicycles. A chair, known as the Vasily, was designed for Kandinsky. Strips of leather were stretched over a cantilevered welded construction of chrome-plated tubular steel. Light, visually arresting and economical to manufacture, it occupies very little space and looks as though it takes up even less. Created by Marcel Breuer, it's one of the archetypes of modern furniture and one of the icons of the age. Photography was exploited not only as an art form, but also as a means of visual communication. Experiments were made with photomontage, double exposures and overprinting. Typography and graphic design made commanding statements bright, bold, simple, and devoid of every kind of decoration. Even serifs were banned. Typefaces and layouts were rethought in terms of optics and communication theory. So were advertising and display. All traditional solutions were ignored. Everything was possible. The face of the 20th century was designed, manufactured, and staged at the Dessau Bauhaus. Sehen Sie mal, das Zentrum da mit der Bühne und der Kantine, 
Stellen Sie sich vor, dort wird moderne Musik gemacht und dann sitzen bei den Zuhörern Klee und Kandinsky neben den Studenten und hören die neuesten modernen äh, Musikfolgen aus dem äh, Konservatorium von Leipzig. Aber es war auch so, dass bei der Kantine manchmal die Wände aufgeschoben wurden und dann tanzte dort ein, äh, ein Maskentanz von Schlemmer. Es waren richtig gehende Feste. Es wurde also ein Thema gegeben, metallisches Fest. Und dann musste man sich danach etwas erfinden, was in diesem metallischen Feste eben richtig war. Und die Bauhaus-Band war so ein Zwie zwischen... Dixieland und sagen wir mal, ja so ein bisschen hat Hindemit auch damit hineingefunkt mit seinem elektrischen Klavier. Wenn wir uns auf die Straße wagten, besonders die Weberinnen, die in Hosen gingen, dann war immer ein Aufruhr da. Das ist unmöglich, sagten die Leute. Und wenn wir kamen mit unserem Pony, sagten die Mütter zu ihren Töchtern, guck da nicht hin, das ist ein Bauhäusler. Also wir waren wohl die Punks hier für die Dessauer Welt. The biggest change at the Dessau Bauhaus was the introduction of an architecture department. Students collaborated on the planning and design of an estate of workers' houses in a Dessau suburb. The estate, intended to deal with an acute housing shortage, consisted of flat-roofed utilitarian dwellings assembled from standard prefabricated parts. Built remarkably quickly, they were cheap to buy or rent, comfortable and easy to run. Financed by the city council, the development was one of the earliest estates of its kind. Head of the architecture department was Hannes Meyer, a communist who believed building was not an art but a science. He soon became the second director of the Bauhaus. When I, in 1928, stepped out because I thought that with the coming up Nazi movement, that I was a factor which did harm to the Bauhaus because they attacked always me. I stepped back and wanted to go again into private activities and made Hannes Meyer to my successor. Hannes Meyer had not told me about his strong leanings towards the very leftish political side. 
Dies hat dann im Lauf der Zeit, der nur zwei Jahre die Meier am Bauhaus war, dazu geführt, dass sich die Tendenz der Schule gleichsam nach links verschoben hat. Was natürlich auch damit zu tun hatte, dass 1929 in der Folge der Weltwirtschaftskrise eine sehr starke, disparate Bewegung in Deutschland war, die ja dann auch den Aufstieg der Nazi-Bewegung begünstigt hat und auf der, auf der linken Seite des politischen Spektrums ein sehr starkes Anwachsen der kommunistischen Bewegung, die auch am Bauhaus aktiv wurde. Dies war der eigentliche Grund, Hannes Mayer 1930 von der Leitung des Bauhauses zu entfernen und Ludwig Mies van der Rohe zu seinem Nachfolger zu bestimmen. They got Mies van der Rohe, who was not a gentleman like Gropius, but a Catholic theoretician from the Rhineland. And if you know Germany, you realize that the Rhineland was different from Prussia. Mies van der Rohe was easygoing, Rhineland, wine drinking, uh, cigar smoking, easy, quiet, secret man, and when Mies van der Rohe got there, he was horrified by the functionist attitude of everything, and he believed in art, and then was a, himself a great friend of, of Paul Klee and of Kandinsky, and uh, he wanted to bring back art as the foundation for the Bauhaus, not losing the discipline. He was much more disciplined than the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus was ideological, but led easily into um, political protests. Under Mies, who became director in 1930, architectural studies dominated the Bauhaus and all political activity was banned, to no avail. In Dessau, as earlier in Weimar, the Nazis gained control of the city council and closed what they saw as a festering sewer of communist, cosmopolitan and Jewish ideas. Sie nannten uns Kulturbolschewisten. Also alles, was bolschewistisch war, war ja kommunistisch, war also böse. Und wir waren durch äh, die Stahlmöbel und äh, durch unsere Verbindung von Kunst und Technik völlig falsch gelagert, denn der Nationalsozialismus hatte eine ganz starke Ausprägung zum äh, Blut und Boden, das nannte man so. Das hieß bäuerliche Möbel, bäuerliche, handfeste Sachen. Dabei ließ er sich vom Speer Möbel machen, die waren auch wie die auf den Dampfern, wie sie auf den, den Reisen, die großen Schiffen. Aber er verlangte von dem Volk, also, dass sie also solche Holzmöbel nehmen. Und er wollte wieder zurück zu der bäuerlichen Einfachheit. Und das war der Sache. Und dann gab es Brauchtum und Sitte. Dann wurde auch noch getanzt. Also, und unsere Jazzmusik war ja absolut verboten. Die ließ man nur, Goebbels ließ sie nur im Film durchkommen. In Filmen durfte man ein bisschen so Tanzmusik machen und so. Das, die hassten uns, weil wir was anders machten. Um, people said, oh, these objects in themselves, they're, they're radical, they're modernist, they, they scare ye olde Nazi aesthetic. That simply isn't true. Bauhaus artifacts were on sale throughout the 1930s in Germany. In shop windows, you'd have a Marianne Brandt kettle next door, a teapot next door to uh, Nazi swastikas and souvenirs of the regime. There's even a famous postcard of Hitler reclining in a tubular steel chair. So it wasn't the objects which caused the problem. The Nazis quite understood industrialization. I mean, autobahns, gas stations, um, the four-year plans, you know, the, the Volkswagen. They understood all that. It was the teachers and the students. And it was that image of the Bauhaus that got them into trouble. Stormtroopers commandeered the Dessau Bauhaus, shattering glass, throwing tools, files, and furniture out of the windows. Another sinister kind of school took over the building. It trained party functionaries. The last home of the Bauhaus was Berlin. Well, 
when it moved into Berlin, its final phase, it was extremely depressing place to work. It moved into a factory. The idealism went, and the masters at the Bauhaus said, ultimately, let's close it down. On the 11th of April, 1933, police arrived with trucks, closed the building, and took some of the students away. By the beginning of 1933, the Nazis had come to power throughout Germany. So the Bauhaus, whose life began with the birth of the Weimar Republic, ended with its extinction. Its 14-year life had exactly mirrored that of Germany itself. The Bauhaus died in Germany, but its teachers and students spread out throughout the free world, taking their ideas and convictions with them. These took deepest root in America, particularly Chicago. Ironically, the enormous reputation and influence of the Bauhaus were enhanced by Nazi persecution. Transplanted to the New World, the Bauhaus idea proved more fertile than ever. Thanks to the presence there of Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, Moholy Nodge, Albers, and many other former members of the Bauhaus, the American city became the architectural proving ground for the industrialized world. Not only the definitive face of the 20th century in architecture and design, but still a crystalline vision of the future. 